All right, thank you and welcome to our first virtual research forum. I am Karen Fletcher. I'm the Director of Grants, Resources, and Services in the Office of Research. I am joined today by many of my colleagues in the Office of Research, as well as our Vice Provost for Research, Ache Carradine, and our presenters. Um, we are excited today to bring to you the topic of Scholarship of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. One of the reasons we chose this topic is because our internal grant, uh, the Scholarship of Diversity, for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion grant is due October 1st. And we thought it was a great opportunity to let some of our past recipients talk about their work um, that they did through the grant and maybe inspire some of you to apply for this grant as well. We do hope to uh, be, to continue these forums on a regular basis. In September, we will be skipping this month um, of September because we are hosting our research and creative activities at Appalachian, otherwise known as RECAP event, uh, September 14th through 18th virtually. Last year was the first year that we hosted this. Um, it was in person. This year we're going to do it virtually so that we will have up to three, I think it's three presenters um, daily uh, that will present on the research as well as have digital posters available for you to view. And then on Friday the 18th, we'll have a live presentation for the awardees of the Chancellor and Provost Awards for Excellence in Research Scholarship and Creative Activity. And they will be presenting their research there as well. So we have a lot of research filled activities in September and we will uh, resume our forum in October and that topic we'll let you know about closer to October. Uh, I am excited. We do have six groups of uh, presenters today to talk about their research. I am going to give them about five to seven minutes um, to talk about the research. I'll set a timer so we'll know when to end. Uh, I know that we'll want to hear a lot more about their research, um, but we're just trying to give you an overview. Please feel free to reach out to them if you want to know more uh, afterwards. We do uh, anticipate having time at the end to have some questions and answers. You all should have access to chat as well if you want to put some questions or comments in there as we go along. Um, some of our presenters may be able to answer them uh, if they have time. Otherwise, we'll try to do them in person at the end. And as well, if you have some research and scholarship in the same areas, uh, please, we're hoping to have some time at the end where you might be able to share that as well, either in the chat or verbally because uh, we do want to be able to build our research community here and talk about the great research we're doing here on campus. Uh, I am excited. I'm joined by some fabulous faculty here at Appalachian to present their research on scholarship of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I will be introducing them as their time starts. So we are going to start with Lee Cope and Carol Green. Lee is with the Student Learning Center and Carol is with the Student Support Services and their title is Resource Utilization Tracking System. And I will turn it over to them. Thank you, Karen. Thanks everyone for being here today and thanks for this opportunity to share about some of the work we're doing in the uh, Student Learning Center. I more or less inherited this project from the former executive director of the Student Learning Center. Um, who wrote the grant initially that was awarded um, for this um, particular project and then um, left to take another position at a different institution. And so um, myself and Carol um, were brought on as the um, co-investigators to kind of continue to the project and finish it up. But the scope of the grant originally was written to try to determine um, if there was any impact on the student from the Student Learning Center and the services that we provide on underrepresented minority groups here at Appalachian State. And so the overall grant award was used to purchase a kiosk and um, other things that were necessary to collect the data as the students interfaced with the different units within the Student Learning Center during the fall 2019 semester. Um, in fall 2019, since that time, there's been some restructuring, but during the fall of 2019, the Student Learning Center consisted of six um, individual units, university tutorial services, academic services for student athletes, academic strategy instruction, student support services, access scholarship program, and a program called As You Are, which serves executive functioning, um, students with executive functioning challenges. And so those six um, programs during fall 2019, we had a streamlined approach for where we um, collected visit data for every student that interacted with all of those different programs within the Student Learning Center. And the eventual goal was to be able to work with IRAP to build out a um, dashboard or a series of dashboards um, that showed any efficacy or any impact as far as those um, interfaces with those programs. To this point, we have been able to successfully complete um, one of the dashboards um, with IRAP. And that focused on university tutorial services um, and the impact or 
um, the look at the impact that the University Tutorial Services may have had with students who interacted with that um, program. And then of course, being able to um, break that down to where there was any impact with um, underrepresented minority groups. And so I'm gonna share my screen if that's okay, Karen, is that okay if I do that? Um, so we can show the actual dashboard that we have built to this point with um, University Tutorial Services. Can everyone see the dashboard is built up. All right, I see Vachel shaking his head, so that means we, we're good. Um, this is looking at tutoring services for fall 2019, and it shows the way that the dashboard was built. Um, it shows a breakdown of all the enrolled courses, um, all the course enrollments that were um, enrolled for fall 2019, and show it shows um, the students that were um, enrolled and did not receive tutoring versus the students that were in a course enrollment that did receive tutoring. So you can see the comparison numbers at the top. And then the average number of visits for the students who did visit University Tutorial Services was 4.8. And then this just, this just shows the grade breakdown um, all the way through the FPI and W for everyone who interfaced with our services. And so it shows the A, B, C, D rate for students who did not receive services in any course and then those who did. Um, that's just an overall breakdown of the services. You can see we had 1,707 individual student contacts for an average number of 4.8 visits. To break that down a little more, we're gonna look, um, here is a breakdown of our embedded tutoring model, which on campus is called LEAD Tutoring, focuses on chemistry courses here at Appalachian State University. We had 913 course enrollments, so 913 students who were enrolled in a chemistry course that did not access university tutorial services, and then 916 students who did and then the average number of visits were six. Important thing for us, whenever we were looking at this, just generalized data, was that it showed that the students who attend embedded tutoring attend at a higher rate versus the students who come to our learning labs and or our drop or our um, small group tutoring. So it helps us to see that um, as far as engagement and student engagement is concerned, the embedded tutoring model that we have in chemistry garners more visits from students than our other two platforms. And so one of the things we're focusing on in the Student Learning Center adjusting is um, trying to develop a way where we can have more of the embedded tutoring model in other courses rather than just in the chemistry course. The next shows a breakdown for Hispanic students who were enrolled in those same chemistry courses. There were 79 students who identified themselves as Hispanic that did not receive any services and then 81 that did. And you can see the average number of visits is 7.7. .7. So the students who identify themselves as Hispanic students actually use that embedded tutoring resource more often than the students in general use that resource. And then you can see the success of those students. So it shows us that the students who identified as Hispanic and participate in the lead tutoring perform significantly well or better than the students who have that same identifier and who do not participate. They earn more A's, more B's, fewer C's, D's, F's, and W's across the board. So it shows the success in that regard as far as students who identify as Hispanic students. The next is breaking it down a little more. Um, we're looking at um, folks, students who identified as black or African-American. There were 28 students enrolled that did not receive services, 32 that did, and their average number of visits was 5.4. You can see the success of the students who participated versus the students who did not participate, significantly more A's, more B's, C's, or fewer, and then fewer D's, F's, and W's. Um, one of the things to know about the lead tutoring model is based on the supplemental instruction model. And we try to focus on courses that have high DFW rates. And so anytime that any group is showing a lower DFW rate, then that speaks to the success of that supplemental instruction, that embedded tutoring model. It doesn't necessarily always um, reflect a great enhancement, but it does reflect that they're um, earning D's, F's, and withdrawing at a lower rate. That's the primary goal of supplemental instruction. And then drilling down even more, we're looking at African-American, black or African-American females. You can see that they, on average, use it um, seven times. 17 enrolled, 21 um, actually enrolled at access to service. And of course, they um, succeed at a higher rate as well based on the data we have here. One of the things that's most interesting to me um, as an individual is when you break it down and you start looking at the African-American men who were enrolled in the chemistry courses. We had 11 who accessed services and 11 who did not. And this is an area where our service breaks down as far as the model is concerned um, for success. We were less successful um, working with African-American men. Um, that 
access the service versus those who did not. Um, and as you can see, there was not a single African American male in the fall 2019 that earned an A in the course, which is one of the reasons why I had this dashboard built was to be able to look at these underrepresented minority groups to see where in the hiring process for university tutorial services we need to focus. Um, and so one thing would be to hire more African American men, but a requirement is they have to have a an A in the course to work as a lead tutor, and we didn't have a single student who met that requirement. So that's an area for us to continue to work with the chemistry department and focus um, in that regard. And so that's kind of an overview of this dashboard for UTS, um, how it would look. Um, the goal is to be able to have a similar breakdown of dashboard for each one of the units. And I'll let uh, my colleague Carol Green from Student Support Services talk about how um, Student Support Services would use this data and or what they want their dashboard to potentially look like. And Carol, if you can do it in about 30 seconds, because we actually are up <laughs> in our seven minutes, we want to give you a chance to give a summary. Absolutely, yes. Just quickly, the next step for this project is to continue to build out these dashboards and with TRIO SSS and ACCESS students, um, we currently serve first generation low income students here on campus and uh, last spring our um, underrepresented population made up 54% of our total students that we serve. We serve 200 students in SSS and 200 students in ACCESS. So I'm really excited about the implications of our dashboard. It will also include those um, grades that we can break down and look at at their academics, but then we also are really focused on retention and persistence and graduation metrics. And so I'd like to add those. We'll be adding those on so that we can do some program evaluation and really use this data to shape what we're doing with our services, including our mentoring, academic coaching, and um, flex hour, which is a special hour each week that our students attend. So um, I think it's really exciting for the future for our programs, but then also how we can serve the um, make some generalizations to the greater student body. Thank you. Thank you, Lee and Carol. Um, very interesting. Our next uh, group is Vaishal Miller, the Director of Doctoral Program in Educational Leadership, and Stacy Garrett, who's in the Leadership Educational Studies. And their title is The Challenge of Culturally Responsive Teaching in North Carolina Community Colleges. All right, we'll make this fast. Um, so St Stacy and I have both taught uh, culturally responsive teaching in, in our uh, higher education program. And what that's about, it's really a pedagogy of inclusion, bringing students' cultural backgrounds, narratives, perspectives intentionally into our curriculum, into our classrooms. And this project was born out of uh, an insight that came in one of my classes about a year or so ago, where a community college administrator, while we we're talking about culturally responsive teaching, basically said, we don't do that. We don't do that. And really, and it seemed as Stacy and I talked about it in the hallway, we, we, we wondered why, because community colleges are one of the most important places for culturally responsive teaching to happen because it's, it's an access point, a key access point for underrepresented students. And it's actually because of transfer students, it's where it's an important feeder for students of color into uh, Appalachian as well. So our inquiry was about the barriers, the challenges of culturally responsive teaching. We did interviews. We interviewed 14 faculty and staff at two uh, regional community colleges. And basically, uh, in a nutshell, what we learned about the barriers. And Stacy, this is a new way of, this is new, the, the way I'm going to frame it here. So let me know if this still makes sense. Um, I'm going to just talk about three barriers that we discovered. One, epistemological that in the sense that community college faculty approach their teaching as math is math, biology is biology, these are not, culture has nothing to do with it. These are separate from culture. So they didn't see in some cases the, the way that culture made a difference in their teaching and saw that as a separate subject. So I think that's an epistemological barrier that in a sense reinforces whiteness. Um, there's a cultural barrier in that Stacy and I thought a lot about uh, what's called colorblind ideology. Basically, what people would say is, we need to treat everybody fairly. So we can't start talking about one person's culture without talking about everybody's culture. So we need, because we need to treat everybody fairly, we're not talking about any of this. And that became a kind of, that colorblind ideology 
which I think is akin to an all lives matter perspective, is pr pretty, pretty widespread at the community college. Also at a cultural level, we learned a lot about how community colleges hiring practices, they reflect, they hire, of course, instructors from local communities, which reflect the dominant cultural values in rural North Carolina. So that's another kind of challenge to culturally responsive teaching. And the third practical one is just in a sense of the resource challenges that community colleges haven't been able to invest in professional development for culturally responsive teaching. A lot of faculty said, we just haven't been trained. We don't know what to do. We don't know what to do. We've heard of this, we're curious about it, but we don't know what this looks like. So whereas places like Appalachian have made a big investment in the pedagogy of inclusion, a lot of community colleges haven't. Uh, there's some emerging efforts, but this is uh, really still beginning to come on their agenda. So that's the nutshell. Did we get it, Karen? Did we get it? Four minutes? Yeah, you did. Just like in four minutes, four and a half okay. minutes. You're good. <laughs> Do you have anything to add? You're good? You're wrapping it up? Stacy, what else should we say? Um, I think the that was an excellent summary. <laughs> um, I think our, our next steps would just be we're in the process of continuing to finish up our data analysis and begin the publishing process. So um, I think what the grant was able to do was afford us um, the opportunity for materials and incentives for our participants, um, because that was, again, another challenge that we saw was that the funding for professional development, the ways in which faculty at community colleges are so overtasked um, with everything that there isn't often quote unquote the time to reinvent and reconsider how they're preparing their courses, how they're incorporating new materials with also some additional limitations from the community college system level in terms of what can be chosen as the required readings and all those things are dictated at levels above the the class and course level, um, which provides some additional challenges. So I think we have a lot of potential next steps. Um, and I think this was a great starting point for, for investigating this question that has a lot of complexities of how and why this isn't happening and what we could do to help support it so that it can happen. Great, thank you, Vachel and Stacy. I appreciate it. Our next group is um, Will Shepard in University Housing and Leadership and Educational Studies, Brandy Bryson, Director of Inclusive Excellence and also in Leadership and Educational Studies, and Adrian Anderson in University Housing and Higher Education Administration. And the title is Black Male Brilliance, Defining Success of First Year Black Males and Implications for Higher Education. Good morning, everybody. Uh, first off, I would like to say uh, Dr. Bryson wasn't able to join us today, but she's definitely here in spirit. Uh, so we'll begin. Uh, first off, this uh, whole grant came uh, about because I, went, I uh, attended a NASPA conference on first generation college students and academic success. And one of the speakers said, there is not enough research out there about black males and them being successful instead of seeing the gap in them and their failures in higher ed. He said, there needs to be something to fill that gap. Okay, the light bulb went off. Okay, if you're gonna say it, I'm gonna do it. So I partnered with Dr. Bryson and we wrote a grant to um, the Fiddler Grant, we won that grant and we started the first round of this uh, grant and the research at HBCUs. And I'm gonna share my screen to talk more about that. Okay. Okay, everybody see that? And so um, what we did, we attended uh, five HBCUs in North Carolina, and uh, we wanted to know what makes black males on campus successful? Who are the higher achievers? Uh, what characteristics do they have to do this? So we selected out of those five HBCUs, uh, 26 males and did focus groups with them at those five universities to get this data. And the biggest themes that came out of this was motivation, persistence, sacrifice, and discipline. 
Now there's a plethora of data that went with this, but this is kind of the subcategories that we found out that most had strength in their identity as black men. Also, they're forward thinking of how they want to be while they're in college and get all the experiences that they can, that when they get out of college, they can give back to their communities, families, and have just a great uh, job or profession going forward. Also, they, they had a cognizance of the limitations. They knew where they uh, were weakest at and where they need the most help, and they used those resources to do that. Also, getting involved and seek resources. They said that getting involved gave them a sense of belonging and also gave them ties to other resources that can help them from social backgrounds to uh, tutoring to other things that said, you know what, I feel like I belong here and I'm supported to meet my goal. So um, for our focus group, we wanted some really specific questions um, to ask, just kind of get a, a grounding for where to start. Obviously, like um, Dr. Shepard said, um, there's an obvious or a well-researched gap um, with African-American males um, on college campuses and their success. Um, but in order to understand what will make them successful, we have to ask them questions um, and not assume um, we can you know, tailor their experience based on ours. Um, so I won't go over all the questions, but um, you know, that first one, what is your why? Um, why, what did you sacrifice to be here? I think um, it's, it's sometimes an, an oversight on those who are willing to help. I mean, we have first gen offices and we have multicultural student services and all those things, uh, but we don't individualize it enough um, with many groups, but this one in particular, um, understanding that these males, um, they may have been a, a breadwinner in their family, um, helping support, um, you know, helping raise siblings, um, earning money and that kind of a thing, um, but they want to better themselves and come to college. Um, well, that's, that's extremely, that's a tearing um, uh, thing to do. You want to better yourself um, for your community, but you're leaving your community to do that. Um, and that can create an identity challenge um, within yourself. So understanding that um, where some of our participants were coming from would be very important. Um, as well as um, getting to know what initiatives, programs, or offices are already helping those students. Um, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So if there's someone doing a great thing um, for a small pocket of individuals, we want to make sure we connect them and that resource and bring that to, um, to the group. Um, and then I think one of the other questions that um, I really liked was asking, um, what would you want to see um, in you know, a mentor or a teacher um, if, if they were to come to this group? Right. Um, for some people, that's people who look like them. Um, for others, it's you know bringing in offices that they show up to the students um, because they've been through conduct, right? But they want to have some more in-depth conversations. So understanding those things um, will only help um, a BMI going forward. So we'll add that the part of these questions we went from an HBCU for the grant, then we transferred it over to PWIs to see how would they compare and what do uh, black males need at uh, PWI. So we actually started this study here at App State. Um, unfortunately, because of COVID, we had some things to set back. We did our first round of interviews. We did not get the uh, data that we wanted. So we're going to try it again this semester. And then you're probably thinking, well, what is going to happen with all this data? So what we're doing is wanting to start a black male initiative here at App State. So what we want to start with this black male initiative is start at men mentoring. Um, key on that word. So what we want to do is I have the men that are black males tour how they're getting through college here. What do they need to be successful? What do they need? Tutoring, they need social support, they need guidance. Whatever that is, we want that to have them to be resilient. After that, we want to look at starting a residence learning community here in the housing department to have a community for them to bond, to uh, share their feelings, to have uh, the chance to share that support with um, counseling centers uh, to talk about those taboos that in our communities that really don't want to talk about. And then overall is to get involved with the recruitment and attention and graduation of black men here at App State. That's the overall goal of what we want to be doing. So um, that is the gist of it and we hope this to come to fruition. And we just wrote a manuscript 
uh, and sent it out about two weeks ago to uh, write in the journal the first part about the HBCU. And hopefully we can do the same thing with App State's data to collect that data, write about it, and also present on this nationally uh, to talk about how this is going to carry black males into the future, especially with going online, COVID, and just the new uh, era of what it's going to be in our society right now. All right, and that is it. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was um, fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing that. Our next group is um, actually our next presenter is Daniel Terrio and from Recreation Management and Physical Education. And the title is The Life and Ideology of Channing Tobias. So prior to sharing my work, I need to share briefly that I do have a disability, which requires me to think through the sounds and the words that I say. So if um, you notice a lengthy pause, or if you notice me seeming to have a hard time saying something, first of all, I'm fine, um, and your Wi-Fi is fine. But if um, you have, if um, there are any words I say that are not very clear, please do not hesitate to let me know. So with that in mind, leisure history is very white. When we look back at who we've chosen to, canonize as leaders of the leisure field. People like John Muir, for example, they share a few things in common. First, they're usually white. Next, they're usually male. And last, for whatever reason, they usually have a beard. Um, and I, and first of all, this is a problem. And it is a problem for a couple reasons. It, it, it is a problem because, first of all, it's just not true. It is not true that people of color do not value leisure. It's not true that people of color have not fought for and built leisure for a very long time. But more than that, I think it's also a very significant problem because when recreation management majors take leisure history courses and do not see people like them, they can clearly get this sense that maybe this is not the field for me. So this particular research project is, um, is part of a larger body of research that I've been working on for the past few years that seeks to retell leisure history from the point of view of people of color. And within this particular project, I'm really narrowing down on the life and thought of one of the black YMCA leaders named Channing Tobias. Um, and my goal in sharing his life and thought is not to frame him as the um, first black person that worked for a YMCA because that's not true. My goal is not to frame him as this one leader that we should hold up. That's also not true. But rather, I think he is someone that we can take seriously as a thinker who can shape what we in the leisure field think and do right now. Um, so one of the so what I'm working on specifically is I'm reviewing some of the speeches that he gave, some of the writings that, that he's done, the letters that he's written and things like that with the goal of trying to reconstruct both his life and what he thought. And one of the primary findings at this point is that recreation was one of many tools that he used in a broader goal of resisting racism. Within the recreation field, we commonly frame recreation as this cure-all, right? If um, you have a problem with your health, recreation can fix that. If um, you want to make friends, rec can fix that too. But what he really recognized is that to work for meaningful change, that you need to take a broader view and you need to create partnerships and um, to enhance the um, level of change that recreation can bring about. 
So um, I think I will stop there. Thank you so much, Daniel. That's very interesting. Thank you for doing that work. Uh, our next presenter is Jacqueline Tilton from the Department of Management, and the title is The Grand Metamorphosis, um, The Grand Metamorphosis Myth, Unpacking the Lived Experience of College Graduates Transitioning into the Workplace. Yes, thank you. And I'm also planning to share my screen if that's okay. So this research is largely motivated from some previous research that we've done where we looked at first generation low income college students and their experiences in college. Um, and there is a, a growing body of research in our department and certainly in the educational fields and many fields that study first generation low income experience in college. Um, but then it kind of drops off what happens next as they're graduating. And we see this what we call the grand metamorphosis myth. Um, repeated over and over again, this idea that um, once they've graduated, you know, they've made it, right? They're now able to be in the middle or upper social class. They've got that degree in hand and they're good to go. Education is this great equalizer. Um, and what we miss in that is that people have social class backgrounds that they don't shed all of a sudden once they graduate. Um, they also have this other myth that workplaces are, are really neutral institutions, kind of a static institution that don't have themselves classed norms within them. Um, so this project, again, looks at first generation low income students, but now that they are graduating, we're following them as they transition into the workplace. Um, so some of the research questions, just very quickly, you know, what is their experience as they're graduating? And we're, you know, in particular, looking at upward mobility. If they're experiencing upward mobility, what's that like? Um, it, are there um, class-based inequalities that are maintained or perpetuated in the workforce? Um, and how does this transition influence their sense of identity? If the idea is that they are now morphing into or, or, or following this upward mobility trajectory and leaving behind this previous identity and um, many of their you know, friends and family members are not on the same path as them, what is that experience like? So that's some of what we were investigating. Um, so we took a grounded theory approach. We are in the middle of a three wave interview design. So we first interviewed them last year, right before graduation. We interviewed them three to five months post graduation. And then our intention was to interview them eight to 10 months after graduation, but with the delays of COVID, we are in the middle right now of conducting that third wave. And they've been in there, um, they've been, I should say, post graduation 12 to 15 months. I can't say they've been in their new organizations for 12 to 15 months because that's not most of their experiences. Um, we do have a pretty diverse sample in terms of um, race and ethnicity, um, but I think what has been a, a bigger emerging theme for us where we see differences is the kind of universities that they attended. We have people from just traditional kind of public state universities. We have a good handful from elite Ivy League institutions and then a handful from um, more liberal arts, smaller colleges. So we're in the middle of analysis, right? We're still collecting data on that third wave, but some of the emerging themes we are seeing from wave one and two um, is first this shifting support and expectations, and I'll kind of speak to them one at a time. So in the institutions, in, a, in an undergraduate institution, they have a lot of support, a lot of programs that are mentioned and this um, hour that we've been talking about has been has been helpful in equalizing. Um, they typically have access to health insurance and for a lot of them they took advantage of mental health resources and support from organizational groups both on the college campus, career services, etc. And then they graduate and all those things just drop off and are all of a sudden without mental health resources, without health insurance. Um, and while they still have some like career services, it's not quite the same thing as being on campus. So there's this big um, cutoff of resources that they had come to rely on. The other thing is they have mixed expectations between um, the institutions that they're graduating from and their family's expectations. So most of their families are like, you need to go get a job. It needs to be well paying and stable. You need to start, start supporting yourself. And the university is typically encouraging, they're like, reach your highest high. And, 
maybe go to grad school and keep striving for that dream job, which is um, often in conflict with what their family expects them to do. Um, one of the most interesting findings that we're seeing emerge is what we're calling in this paper a lingering lack of belonging, but a more um, popular phrase might be the, a resurgence of imposter syndrome. So we know from all the literature about students entering the college setting that they have this imposter syndrome, but from our sample, by the time they're graduating, they've largely overcome that college imposter syndrome. They're on the brink of getting their degree and they're like, you know what, I deserve to be here just as, money, just as much as anyone else. I've earned the same degree as everyone else. And they have this great resilience and kind of overcoming um, that lack of belongingness. And then they get into the workplace and it kind of, again, all drops off and starts back at square zero. They haven't worked in a corporate setting. Their parents haven't worked in a corporate setting. They don't have someone to guide them through the norms and expectations. Um, and then some other things in terms of the differences we're seeing within the sample. Like I mentioned, we're seeing some differences between the institutions that they went to. So we find that people who are, went to elite institutions have the most class-based language to understand their position. They're familiar with terms like imposter syndrome. They're, they're well aware of the inequality and inequity. Um, those that are at the private, private liberal arts schools are often very unaware of class. Um, but because of that, they're often um, less disgruntled. They're kind of blissfully unaware of these class-based inequalities where those at the elite institutions are very aware of the inequality um, that often makes them much more unhappy and um, having to find coping skills to deal with that and try and change the system. Um, and the last one I'll mention is uh, something that Dr. Shepard mentioned with um, their, um, his sample as well, is this idea of wanting to give back. We see this very consistently across gender and across racial groups and across the kinds of institutions. Um, it's both giving back and paying it forward. So wanting to help the people who helped them, but also help people like them that didn't have the help that they wish they would have had. Um, so the sense of giving back what they have been given is very strong um, and a huge motivator for them. Um, so that's kind of the, the basics of my research. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Uh, I will move on to um, our last presenter, Belinda Walter in English. And the title is Locating Practices of Inclusive Excellence Within the Writing Classroom. Great, thank you. And I also have uh, my research partner, Brett Zawilski here, who's gonna help me present. So I'm gonna share my screen really quickly here. Okay, can everyone see that okay? All right, excellent. So um, uh, yeah, so we, um, we got the Scholarship of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion grant in the spring of 2019. Um, and we decided to, uh, what we wanted to look at was sort of where and how um, diversity and inclusion was happening in the writing classroom here at App State. Both of us um, uh, are in English departments and we're, we're trained in, in writing pedagogy. So we kind of wanted to look at what, what was happening at, at home, so to speak. Um, and so our original kind of, our original premise was to observe the practices of DI in writing classrooms. and. Um, at App, this is particularly important because we um, ostensibly, the writing program sees, you know, a huge amount of students uh, in um, across the, our two different uh, gen ed uh, course requirements. And so understanding how this pedagogy is happening in these classes, um, we thought would be a really good way to think about how it's happening in the institution at large as well. So, um, you know, our goal was to, observe first and foremost, right? To see uh, um, what was happening and then to ascend to, you know, hopefully make those practices more visible and then look at, um, look at holes potentially for additional training, additional um, professional development, et cetera. Um, we did have some challenges. Um, some folks are talking about, you know, future iterations at the end. We'll talk about ours at the beginning. Uh, in the middle, uh, right after we got the grant, um, Brett Zawilski took a, another um, opportunity, job opportunity in Ireland, which is really exciting. So he's zooming in from Ireland today. Um, and so uh, what that did was it enabled us to actually rework our entire project in order to make it collaborative across the, this um, transatlantic uh, partnership. 
Um, but it also slowed down our data interpretation and our ability to kind of understand what was, you know, what we'd collected in the um, in the spring of 2019. So um, we're just going to show you one piece of what we've done so far with the idea that we've got a lot more, we've collected a huge amount of survey data. Um, and then we hope to also collect additional data um, from uh, uh, Dr. Zwilski's university as well in, in Ireland and do some comparisons. So Brett, I'll turn it over to you for our next slide. Sure, so again, the methodology that we established here is looking primarily at App State students and you really wanted to get a holistic view of how DI is implemented within the composition classroom. And to that end, we instituted first surveys, uh, questionnaires of both students and faculty. Um, we received 461 responses from students and 36 from the rhetoric and composition faculty there. We looked at syllabus to uh, sort of like analyze the language that was used in those instances, uh, really collected a lot of definitions, and we'll go into that in the next slide actually. But in terms of the quantitative analysis, we were making use of inductive coding to sort of establish how individuals were defining diversity, inclusion, the relationship across both and how that relates to their coursework. The qualitative analysis comes in the form of phenomenography, which is looking at the qualitatively different experiences that both students and faculty had with DI at app. And to do that, we ran two focus groups, one for students and one for faculty, where they had a chance to sort of expand upon their experiences with diversity and inclusion in the App State classroom. So uh, yeah. So in terms of the structure of our actual survey, we want to gather first demographic data so that we could just aggregate uh, the different years, courses, majors the students had along with their um, sort of uh, you know demographic information, their identities, um, really, and uh, try to sort of you know disaggregate across the main questions, which were how do you define diversity. How do you find inclusivity? What's your relationship between the two? And finally, we really wanted to dig into this, uh, uh, you know, the relationships between their experiences at App State in general, the rhetoric and composition general ed program, and their specific classes. And this is important because in rhetoric and composition, there's a lot of DI as part of the, the paradigm of the moment that we have it built into the field in terms of our statement on students' rights to their own language, and even the more recent National Council of Teachers of English demand for Black linguistic justice. So our faculty have had, uh, using the R and inclusive for the past tense here, but um, have had a lot of training in terms of sort of like anti-racist pedagogies, approaches towards uh, teaching um, critical race uh, pedagogy, and we really wanted to get a sense of how is this manifesting itself in the classroom? Are these things that are uh, sort of, uh, are they being embodied in those locations? So, I think it was 462 students that we could use. And, as, and kind of interpreting it, um, we decided to look at how students define diversity and inclus inclusivity um, in particular and like and use that as our sort of grounding um, coding mechanism because um, what we were observing was that these definitions have this tendency to become depoliticized and to mean kind of everything and nothing at the same time. And of course, this is informed by scholarship in the field too. Um, so we revised our question to think about how diversity and inclusion is actually being experienced and defined um, in the in the classroom um, and then to think of uh, sort of to look at uh, whether or not this institutionalized language has depoliticized these efforts that we're doing with the with the training and everything um, so this is a bit of a messy slide but bear with me we did we had these um, we generated a coding mechanism of yes no maybe to hand code the student definitions of diversity and inclusivity and they were right in definitions so we went through and coded them by yes, no, or maybe, and re yes was recognition of systemic or structural oppression and inequity. Um, no was, you know, language that did not recognize systemic structural oppression or inequity. And maybe was sort of, it kind of did, but we couldn't tell. Um, so a, a sample of a yes um, from the diversity definition was, um, I define diversity 
as the, the big mixture of all different people. Diversity is the integration of all people, no matter gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or religion. It is including everyone and giving everyone the ample opportunity for success. So without going into too much detail, we had a couple of key words in there that, um, uh, that, we helped, that helped us understand that this, this definition gets at the structural oppression. Um, and we have about 30 more seconds for you. Okay, perfect. Brett, do you sorry, want to let's mute. Yeah, sorry, muted. You know, typical Zoom problem. Um, and so that kind of works. The last two slides are just kind of uh, representations of the data that we found in terms of looking at the kind of relationship between individuals who had systemic, uh, who recognized systemic injustice, structural, racial uh, diversity issues, and both diversity inclusivity. Um, and then the final slide kind of shows a matrix of how those overlap. And so right now we're working to kind of uh, sort of determine the correlation between individuals who were able to recognize structural inequalities and diversity uh, as compared to structural inequalities and notions of inclusivity. So looking at their definitions, coding those, and attempting to uh, see what the relationship is between those, what that might say in terms of how the pedagogy and rhetoric and composition is being um, taken up by students. And of course, uh, the end result of this is really going to expand this um, to cross-institutional eventually, but there's a lot of data here to sort of examine how this is being taken up by the RETCOM program at App. All right, thank you so much, um, Belinda, and thank you, Brett, for joining us from Ireland. We do appreciate it. Uh, so, uh, I want to thank all our presenters again for this fabulous research that you've been doing, all very intriguing, and I'm so excited that you are continuing on with it. I'd like to open it now for any questions that some people might have or if they'd like to share some of um, the research or scholarship that they might be doing at App that might be relatable or related to the Scholarship for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Or ask any questions of our presenters as well. This is an opportunity to do that. Everyone gave such great presentations. We're all thinking about it and digesting it, <laughs> which is great. Let me, we, let me ask one. Oh, sorry, oh, I just interrupted Karen. Sorry, Karen. Um, Jack, uh, Jacqueline uh, or Jackie? So I have a question for you. <laughs> Do you know if there's a, um, there are opportunities for postgraduate uh, connections with the alumni that can be um, built or uh, investigated for the issue that you've investigated? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there are plenty of, um, plenty of need for it. Um, and we have right, a bag in terms of our participants. Um, which of them had those programs available to them. Um, so some of them, I mean, many of our, our participants mentioned programs like our SSS, you know, things that were instrumental in their success in college and keeping with them. Um, many of them don't keep up with them very well after they graduate, um, but some of them do. And I think there is opportunity to try and foster that as much as possible. Um, yeah, and I think it, it has the added benefit if you build the program right that those people can then in turn be mentoring other, many of them desire to give back, right? So they can be mentoring other students that are still in college um, and see their experience and help them through that. I have a question. Um, so a lot of you mentioned future research and some of you mentioned um, next steps for where your research is going or where you're submitting manuscripts or presenting um, your outcomes. But I think I only heard Dr. Shepard talk about actual programs he intends to implement here at the university or changes. Are there other um, others of you who intend to keep moving your work forward to see actionable, implementable changes in our communities on campus. So, Bachel and Stacy, you're also with our community college colleagues. Um, I don't know what sort of work can, needs to be done before we're at that point, um, but I would be interested to know how those of you who are kind of at the end stage of wrapping up phase one of, of this project m intend to move forward into actionable items that impact our community. I'll hop in real quickly to say that our intention is 
um, partly to speak to what could happen at a university setting, but more so to speak to organizations, um, kind of taking, passing the baton, if you will, what can organizations be doing with, you know, these new hires and new employees to be more inclusive um, and to support these people. So we can talk about networking at the university, but many, some organizations that we've seen um, have great mentorship programs within them or um, um, extra training to help those students take the, or graduates, I, I, you know, they're all the same to me, um, take that next step inside the organization and be successful and, and kind of have continued support. One of the major long-term goals I have in my work is to change the way that leisure history is usually taught. So one of the major results of my work will be that I um, share my work through lessons that can easily be woven into common recreation and leisure courses. Yeah, that's awesome. I wondered if you would be like working on a textbook or something with colleagues, if that would be something in your future to integrate into the curriculum. I thought that was super fascinating. I think similarly, that's part of our most immediate steps uh, is thinking about how we are preparing our students. Um, we have a, an MA and an EDS in higher ed and a lot of our students work in the community college sector. So how are we engaging them in these conversations so that they're prepared um, to do this work and to challenge their colleagues um, right there to do more of this uh, kind of culturally relevant pedagogy. I think also we've talked about and there was some interest in going back and doing some of that training that was requested. Um, and so really having that direct impact on our local community college to say like, hey, thanks for participating in our study. We heard these things and now we want to help provide the solution and to provide some of what you've been asking for. Um, and then, you know, the way that my mind works, you think and you spiral down where the root causes are for like, where does this start? <laughs> And how do we attack kind of those lower levels and, and dig into, you know, before they get here or the hiring or the structures of the environments like so I'm trying to not go down that rabbit hole. But um, I think to answer your question Katie, <laughs> directly, the most immediate uh, response is again publishing and then turning around this information and to how we're we're enacting our practice. How are we modeling? How are we training and how are we having that most direct connection back? I can, I can jump in and talk about the writing program a, a little bit as well. Um, similarly, uh, you know, ours will have, like, the research that we conduct will have direct implications on what we do in the writing program, how we um, conduct and structure professional development and um, training. But I should say also, and Brett alluded to this as well, that it's, it's already part, like, the is part of a larger agenda that already exists in the program. So um, in fact, it's sort of the data collection arm of work that we already know that we're working on and, and building toward. And we have sort of a multiple step plan in the program to really integrate this work much more robustly, all the way from you know, um, professional development and training faculty through We've, we just last year um, implemented a mission statement around diversity and inclusion and then um, working on kind of being able to report this institutionally and in ways that matter in merit reviews and things like that. Um, so this data I think should be, we haven't actually reported it to the faculty yet. This was our first uh, you know, take at kind of making sense of it, but um, I'm looking forward to talking to the, the RC faculty and hearing their take on what we're seeing here as well. And if I could jump in about um, the RUTS program, Research Utilization Tracking System, one thing that this grant enabled us to do was really centralize our contact tracking. Um, each unit that Lee described, all six units in the Student Learning Center, were doing some form of tracking, um, but not everybody was doing it through the same, the same system. And um, I think that th what this project has shown us is that it's very helpful to have one system gather everything and that then we are also looking for ways that we can collaborate, looking at what all the different services that we provide, what is most effective, what is that critical number, what, um, what needs to happen to make an impact on the student. So um, our next steps are to continue to 
have the staff tracked um, all of their contacts with students so that these dashboards are live updated and then we will get into what I'm hoping, this is my data dream though, um, is to have a real, a real regular process of um, evaluating what we're doing. So um, not just the advisors will check on there, you know, when they think about it, but more, okay, you know, in July and in December, we have regular full meetings to really dig into the data and figure out what are we doing, what's making an impact, and what do we need more of, and where can we find that collaboration across our units. So that's, I think, um, our hope for our next steps too. Um, thank you all of you for answering that. I just find it super exciting um, and I'm so inspired by all of you and all of your work. And I think I speak for the entire Office of Research when we say that we would love to talk to you more about your work and help you fund um, future steps of your work if you need that support. So if you're interested in seeking additional funding um, for your work, please reach out to myself or um, Sid Zester um, on, the, on the call as well. And we would love to talk to you about how we can support you moving forward. So thank you. Yeah, so thank you, Katie, for that perfect segue into, um, um, we really do thank all of our presenters um, for the work you're doing and for presenting here today. Uh, and also we are, if you are attending today, we are gonna send you just a sample of a few general um, grants that are out there on diversity, equity, and inclusion. It just is scratching the surface. So if you are interested, as Katie said, please reach out to us, grs at epstate.edu, uh, because we can take your topics and really match them with some of the funding opportunities that are out there so we can continue to gain um, knowledge of, of this area. Uh, we thank all of you for attending today. Thank you so much for making um, this first forum a success. And we look forward to continuing these conversations. Uh, again, closer to October, we will let you know what our October uh, topic is, and please join us in September, September 14th through 18th for our recap event to hear more research presentations from Appalachian faculty, and you'll see information about that uh, continue to come out through our, um, our Google groups and our announce system and our social media. So thank you all. Thank you presenters again, and uh, keep gaining knowledge, and we will see you at another time. Thanks so much. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>